and uh, I share. There you go. Continue. So, um, hi everybody. Um, I see people entering the room in the meanwhile. So, hi. I believe I saw the name of Yvonne also. Uh, and, well, first of all, thanks a lot for having me uh, at least virtually there. You know, I would have rather been physically there and, as I was saying, you know, getting out and have a beer with all of you after we are done. Um, but uh, th this is this is how we can do now. So um, yeah, the the this you know I really took seriously the lectures word in this preliminary lectures. So I'm going to talk about phenomenology of particle production during inflation, uh, and I will um, you know start from um, a very pedagogical and very sketchy in a sense. Um, presentation and then I will ramp up going to a little bit more rigorous and then I will review what I think are several important aspects of phenomenology of particle production and in general you know theory of particle production during inflation um, and um, well let's see if I can go ahead so this is the plan as I said generalities on particle creation um, then I will. I decided to follow what is roughly a historical development. So I will move immediately to cosmology and talk about particle creation at preheating. This is not strictly speaking part of the topic because preheating is not during inflation, but is at the end of inflation. Um, but it's useful to set things up. Um, then uh, I will talk about Isolated events of particle creation during inflation. There was a first important interest in this um, in this topic towards the end of the 90s and early 2000s. Then uh, many subsequent events of particle creation during inflation. This was about 2005, and then the 2010s, where there was quite a bit of work on creation of vectors during axial inflation. Uh, we heard uh, something quite a bit about axial inflation yesterday from our those lectures. Um, and uh, so thanks to Arthur, because I will not have to you know, motivate that too much. And uh, in the last couple of years, and this is especially mostly from my point of view, um, we worked also on fermions during actual inflation, which I think is another part that has not been explored as much and I think is interesting. Um, so please, please, please interrupt. It uh, seems that it's superfluous what, since what, what I've seen in the last couple of days, but you know, please interrupt if you have any questions. And uh, as a disclaimer, you know, this is my point of view on this. I will, uh, I'm sure I will omit a lot of citations and um, uh, you know, apologies to people that I'm not referring to from the beginning. Um, I tried my best, but I'm sure this would not work. Um, so let me start from the text of argument. Text of argument of why do we need quantum field theory? We need quantum field theory because um, special relativity tells us that we don't conserve number of particles. This is what happens in classical mechanics, but in special relativity, the only thing that is conserved is energy. On the other hand, uh, quantum mechanics you learn uh, as an undergraduate student uh, uh, is based on conservation of particles. Actually, you have the wave function as a function of a particle. So you need to put those, if you try to put these two things together, you immediately get into a contradiction. And because of this, you have to move up. And the way to move up is to move to quantum field theory. In fields, on the other hand, the number of particles intended as, you know, whatever, waves is not conserved. They can have two waves that scatter and form four waves or something like this. So um, quantum field theory has a built-in property, the possibility of not conserving particle number. And uh, as I said, particle production is built in quantum field theory and the standard applications are particle decays, for instance, or um, in you know, scatterings. I don't know, I'm making this one up now. E plus E minus that goes to E plus E minus E plus E minus. I'm making this up again, but this is a possible process. The thing that is interesting and that on the other hand is a little bit less standard, well, not for this audience probably, but in general, is that even initial states with 
that are non-trivial but correspond to zero momentum states, so say, states where the system is only time dependent, can lead to particle creation, which is interesting by itself because you start from an initial system that is time, uh, as I said, an initial system that is only time dependent but space independent, and you end up with a system that is space, space dependent too. We have production of particles with a certain wavelength, and uh, these particles are, well, they are in some particular state in which, um, you know, when they are generated, they are created in a pure momentum state, but in general, um, can be treated as inhomogeneity. So this allows to go from a homogeneous system to an inhomogeneous system. And uh, this is uh, a non trivial property. I, uh, you know, there is a super cartoonish description of how this happens, and this is the one I will give now. It turns out to be super cartoonish, but maybe just because of dimensional analysis, it turns out actually to work pretty fine. So the idea is that in quantum mechanics, going really, really to the basics, you know, in quantum mechanics, we cannot say anything about anything of definite. And in particular, we, don't, we cannot even say that the vacuum is totally empty. So we can picture the quantum mechanical vacuum or the quantum field theoretical vacuum as um, being full of virtual pairs of particle antiparticle, for instance, that are created and annihilate. Um, and in the short time they exist, they violate Heisenberg relationships. So for physical particles, you want that the error in the momentum times the error in the position is larger than the Hubble, uh, than the Hubble parameter. Good morning. Then the Planck's constant, and same thing with the energy. But for these virtual particles, this is the opposite. Um, and we don't see those particles. And if we are just in empty Minkowski space, that's the end of the story. Um, however, if there is some external force, then these virtual particles can be considered as being pulled away from each other. For instance, let's consider the example of a positron and an electron uh, pair. And uh, suppose that there is some electric field pointing towards the right. Then if the electron is to the left and the positron is to the right, and this actually will matter a little bit, the positron is pushed more to the right, electron is pushed more to the left. In the short time in which these particles exist, they are accelerated. So their position is given by the electric field divided by their mass times delta times squared. And it turns out that this proper, these particles can become real if this quantity on the left hand side satisfies now the Heisenberg relations, uh, the normal Heisenberg relations, if you want. So with an H bar, with a larger than H bar. And, uh, you know, if we put that the momentum is typically the mass times the speed of light, it doesn't really matter too much, but order one parameters in front of it, then delta time is given by this relation. This is again the Heisenberg relation for energy. Then one just obtains that this mechanism is efficient as long as the mass squared of the particles is smaller than the char electric charge times electric field in appropriate you know, natural units. It turns out that if one does a proper analysis of this, this is really how it works. Uh, if I want to be more, th then you, know, you could complain to me and say, wait a second, you are violating energy conservation. You know, I started with zero particle and now I have two particles. And that's one of the places where this thing is quite cute. When I produce these two particles, I'm producing two charged particles, electric, ele uh, positron and electron, and the two charged particles will have their own electric field that is pointing from the positron to the electron. So the electric field produced by the pair of particles opposes the original electric field. The difference in the two electric fields is uh, um, so this means that this created electric field reduces the external electric field between the two particles and one can compute the change in energy density in that electric fields and miracle of miracles it exactly corresponds to mc squared actually 2 mc squared so thankfully energy is conserved okay going closer to um our world, uh, we can do the same thing in the case in which a universe is accelerating. Also in that case, virtual particles or any particles are subject to a relative acceleration 
that is given by the Hubble parameters times C. Let's assume that we are in an inflating universe, so the Hubble parameter is constant, then this is exactly the relative acceleration of the two particles. Um, in general, this would be some A dot dot times AC or something like this. Um, and so one can play exactly the same game as before. Now the distance between the two particles is HC delta T squared impose this condition, impose the same condition, and you get again the result that the mechanism is efficient for MC square smaller than the Hubble parameter. Um, so this is a very particularly view of um, the generation of cosmological perturbations. We will see later on that, uh, you know, a more proper way of doing things is to use, you know, the full formalism of quantum field theory. It's a very particularly point of view also because you see these particles tend to uh, you know, eventually the, the wavelength of these particles quickly becomes super horizon. And if a wavelength of the particle is larger than the observable universe, then it, you know, it doesn't really make too much sense to talk about particles at all. You know, particles are things with a wavelength, definite wavelength with which I can build some wave packet in my room, or at least, you know, in a regional space that is much smaller than uh, the, the scale of curvature of space time. Um, but still, it works. Okay, let me go to a less pictorial description um, because now we will give the get here the math that we need to go ahead. If I have just a the Fourier modes of a scalar phi with mass m, they satisfy this well-known equation, and then we can quantize in this well-known way. And the crucial point here is that when I quantize, I have this creation annihilation operators that are objects that annihilate quanta of phi with momentum k or create them. Um, what if omega is a function of time? Well, there's, um, since I mentioned electric field and I mentioned the, uh, um, <coughs> expansion of the universe, what happens for omega in the case of an electric field? It gets this expression. What happens if you are in an expanding universe? It gets this expression in general, um, where the scale factor explicitly depends on time. Uh, H and H dot might or, might or might not depend on time, depending on the universe I'm considering. But in general, I have some time-dependent frequency here. And so this way of quantizing things that I was showing here doesn't work, strictly speaking. However, we can still quantize working in the so-called limit of adiabat adiabaticity condition. As long as omega dot is much smaller than omega squared, this is the so-called adiabaticity condition, the solution to this equation with omega square a function of time is approximately given still by the same expression we had before. e to the minus i was omega t, now becomes integral of omega in dt divided by square root of two omega. So we can still quantize our field. And we still have a unique definition of creation annihilation operator. Okay. Um, the problem is if this condition is not satisfied, and this is where interesting physics happen. If omega square uh, is smaller than omega dot, I don't have, I cannot define this positive energy and negative energy solutions in a unique way. Actually, no, I cannot define it at all. And so wherever this condition is not satisfied, uh, the number operator that is generated, created as A dagger A is not well defined because I don't know what is A dagger because I don't know what multiplies the positive frequency and the negative frequency solutions in my model composition because I don't know what is positive frequency and negative frequency. So for instance, and this means that particles can be created or even absorbed during this process. For instance, this is in the case of, you know, the evolution of omega dot over omega squared in the presence of some electric field uh, with some, for some mass. And you see that at some point it becomes larger than one. In this region here, this period of time, the number of particles is not well defined. Great. So, what we have, however, is what we consider in general to be the case, and this will be the setting we will be considering for the first half, at least, of this presentation, uh, is a regime where you have an initial time. We have some mid intermediate time T0, and in an initial time T much smaller than T0, and the later time T much larger than T0, the adiabaticity condition is defined. 
but is not satisfied in between. So going back to the plot I had before, this means that in particular, we can impose that our mode functions at early times are given by just these positive frequency solutions. In the middle, they're given by some expression that we cannot, uh, you know, I cannot tell you on, unless I know what is the, the evolution of omega as a function of time. And at the late time, we know on the other hand that the abatic approximation will be valid again, which, um, will mean that um, the solution will be a linear combination of positive and negative frequency solution. But this linear combination, the coefficients of this linear combinations will not be one and zero as at the beginning, but will be some numbers that are determined by the behavior in between. There is actually some nice way of analytically continuing from this solution to this solution, the complex plane, I'm not gonna go there. But you can actually compute alpha and beta just moving from here through the complex plane to here without even knowing exactly what's going on here, which is cute. Um, okay, these coefficients alpha and beta are known as the Bogolubo coefficients. And as we will see, they decide uh, what, how things work and what, you know, how many particles we have produced in the meanwhile. So let's go back at early times before T naught. Uh, my wave, my field was decomposed this way. At later times, I said that this function e to the minus i omega t becomes some linear combination alpha e to the minus i omega t plus beta e to the i omega t. And this one will be just be its complex conjugate. I can rearrange this solution in this new way where I have again only positive frequencies here and only negative frequencies here. And I can declare that this object here is a new annihilation operator. And this object here is a new creation operator. In a sense, the idea is like, imagine you are a, an observer that was born well after the period of non-adiabaticity and you want to quantize your field. Then what do you do? Well, you look at your mode functions and you discover that they have a positive frequency and negative frequency component. And you just declare that your annihilation operators are those that multiply the positive frequency and the creation of those that multiply the negative frequency components. And uh, you declare that you, these are your creation annihilation operators. But there's a but. This is okay, as long as you are talking only about the field decomposition, but um, we are working in Heisenberg representation, the state has not changed. So the vacuum of the system is the same vacuum that was there at very, very early times. And <coughs> at very, very early times, the vacuum was annihilated by the A operators. So if I am this observed, observer born after T naught, I will define a number operator that will be B dagger B, but the state of the vacuum, sorry, is the state um, that I had at early times. And so I will, um, I can compute the expectation value of the number operator and I will discover that actually it's proportional to beta squared. So as long as beta is non-different, uh, different from zero, um, I have um, a phenomenal particle creation. Um, notice one thing from the <coughs> point of view of the procedure. Um, there's a, there's a, we are really doing some sort of renormalization. You know, if you go back again to your quantum field theory one classes, you remember that the number operators is really a dagger a plus a, a dagger divided by two, and then we normal order it. There's an interesting prescription here because we are normal ordering the new creation annihilation operators. And this is how basically we are renormalizing a way uh, all the original vacuum fluctuations. Actually, it's possible to show that this procedure is equivalent to the so-called procedure of adiabatic subtraction in which you compute just the two-point function of your field and then subtract the same expectation value of the, two field, the same field written in terms of the adiabatic approximation for the field. Um, in any case, this was for the no, generalities. A useful formula very often, but not always, one can write omega square in the following form, where this m square of t can be some efficient, uh, um, some effective mass uh, or something. And uh, 
the, if you remember the condition for non-adiabaticity was omega dot much larger than omega squared. And this condition is maximally satisfied when omega squared is equal to zero. So if m square of t crosses zero, then I, that's the time where I can have a particle production, okay? So one can actually determine more or less precisely a time where the particle production happens. And is when this parameter n square crosses zero and one can compute the number of particles well after t naught and turns out to be given by this expression e to the minus pi k square divided by m dot. By the way, for those of you that you know, are familiar with Schwinger effect, the term is for Schwinger effect is e to the minus pi m square divided by e e. And if you use the formula I gave you before, this, you know, in the case of Schwinger effect, this k square is really the mass of the particle and m dot is really the charge of, uh, is really the electric field. So everything matches nicely, including the pi's, et cetera. Um, just going back one last thing, because it might be interesting later on. Um, if I really look, you know, at time t naught, omega dot over omega is actually strictly zero. This really tells us that the particle production occurs in some amount of time. And the amount of time is really the time in which this non-adiabaticity condition is imposed. Um, so it's not instant, and this will impose constraints on what they are telling later on. The phenomenon takes some time, and usually in order to understand this phenomenon, we better you know, impose that this time scale is sufficiently short in order in, um, in terms of other time scales. Um, okay, I'm ready to go ahead and talk about cosmology. Any questions on this super pedagogical, well, I don't know if it was super pedagogical, but you know, super introductory part. Sorry, may yes. I ask you a question? I simply forgot this stuff. Uh, the, the commutation relations of bees are still the same, right? Yes. And uh, they are related obvious? to some- Is it, is it obvious because you, you are now- No. I mean, okay, good. So can you comment on that? <laughs> I, I can. There's something I didn't write here. It turns out that um, there's, uh, for this kind of equation, you have um, a conserved quantity. Uh, well, a, a conserved condition that basically imposes that for bosons, the absolute value of the parameter alpha square minus the absolute value of the parameter beta square is equal to one. Is equal and to a constant. That condition comes and from... then that constant is equal to one by initial condition. Okay, I understand. Sorry. That's, so this condition is, would, is this condition That, that condition is, su is sufficient to impose that B, B dagger, uh, if A, A dagger have the right commutation, then B, B dagger have the right commutation. And that condition you can always satisfy or what do you do about this? Con this is automatic or what? It's always, it's automatically satisfied. It's just from the equations of motion. Oh, I see. That's um, because you explicitly know the function alpha k and beta k and they are, they satisfy. They, so the alpha k and beta k always satisfy alpha k square minus beta k square equal to one. Okay. If you solve uh, for, um, um, you know, it's related to the Ronskian condition. You okay. have conserved Ronskian for this, you know, you have a Schrodinger equation and you have mm -hmm. a conserved Ronskian and the conserved Ronskian is proportional to alpha square minus beta square. Okay. okay. And all of this happens That's now you're thinking of this in the sitter or what, what is the setting? I mean, the back is the- I'm thinking of this in any kind of system in which I can bring the equations of motion to this form. There is an important caveat. Um, you have to have a Cauchy surface. No, you have to have, you have to have slicing and universal time defined over, over a whole system. Yes, yes. That's usually- I need to have a Cauchy surface so that I want to impose that the initial number is well defined and zero, the vacuum is vacuum everywhere at some initial time. There's another more sub to, well, there's an important condition that is, uh, I'm assuming that omega squared is real here and real here. Okay, that's also not true. Sorry, omega squared is positive here. Omega is real here and real here. Um, if that doesn't happen, um, I run into some complications. Um, but if that doesn't happen, my definition of particle is kind of fishy. You know, what's a particle? 
so, sorry, we, we, are, are we going to talk about about uh, perturbations in cosmology in, 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 during inflation? Then it, it's not yes. true outside the horizon, right? They are on the absolutely, horizon. absolutely. Um, that goes into some really subtle matters that you know I can talk about, uh, and uh, it, things can get really complicated in that case. So for for cosmological perturbations, what we usually do is just forget about Bogolyubov coefficients, forget about renormalization and everything. Right. Uh, and, uh, and we just solve classically the equation of motion. And uh, we just, you know, we say, well, the, the effects we observe are really at large scales. And at large scales, we really, you know, this, this phenomenon, this process is in particular useful for, for renormalization, as I was saying before, you know, normal ordering is useful to renormalize. Uh, and usually people say, you know, we just, you know, pray the good God that, you know, something good happens in the UV, but we don't care because the only thing we observe are really at large scales. So usually we solve during inflation, we solve for the classical solution, and we just hope that nothing about that happens uh, at large scales because of, you know, renormalization of other more rigorous way of doing things. There is a paper by Parker from the mid 2000s where he tries to apply adiabatic subtraction to this generation of uh, large scale perturbations. He applies all the textbook rules and he gets a result that doesn't make too much sense. That is, uh, um, turns out that the renormalization actually can affect modes that are well outside of the horizon. Mm -hmm. Not exponentially large, I mean, not necessarily all the way to, to the large horizon, but it can affect. And my, I, I actually work in progress on this because my feeling is that, that there, there's things that still need to be understood there. Okay. Um, I will talk about perturbations later. Uh, but for, for the purpose, in particular, the first half of this talk, um, uh, what I'm telling here is all well understood. We are talking about real frequencies. We are going to talk about wavelengths that are much shorter than the horizon. We're really talking about stuff that could happen even in Minkowski space. Okay. Uh, is it a problem that you are restricted to to the static patch probably? Or how, which coordinates are you using on the center? Or are you using global coordinates? What would I use? I'm, I'm, uh, no, I'm using not global coordinates. There can be a problem with the choice of coordinates, absolutely. But uh, again, for the first half of my talk, I will be just be worried about. So, wait. Let me ask a question: Are you thinking about particle creation, or about the generation of perturbations? I'm trying for to particle... think what you will be. What you will, so, I'm, I'm happy to think about either, but I don't yet know where you are going. So, for particle creation, I will discuss processes that happen well inside the horizon. So then I can think Minkowski In that space. case, I don't care whether I am static patch or anything else. I see. So I can think about quantum um, theory uh, and changing background field, basically. Good. Then exactly. I'm happy. Then I'm happy. Okay, good. Absolutely. For the second case, we anyway have a problem because of the... Exactly. Okay, good. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Now, thanks for asking because actually this will become, might become relevant later on. Actually, it will become relevant. I, I will go back to it. So... Uh, I was saying, um, yeah, so applications, <coughs> the first cosmological, oops, the first cosmological application my, for, of this stuff I'm aware of is in a paper by Dolgov and Kirilova that study this model where you have some scalar field phi they don't talk about it as the inflaton unless you go until you go to the very last chapter and they just say i have a scalar field chi and uh, i have this field phi whose vacuum expectation value is evolving for any reason so again it could be very well in minkowski these two terms together give some effective mass so this when this effective mass is a minimum i have a phenomenal particle production and then in the last chapter of their paper, uh, they uh, in particular say, well, this could be during reheating at the end of inflation. So inf I have some inflationary potential and at the end of the inflation, the inflaton crosses the origin and starts oscillating about the origin. When it crosses the origin, this quantity here is a minimum. Since this quantity is a minimum, I can have non-perturbative particle production. So I could have production of quantum of chi. And then there are these two other papers that did this in more detail. And in particular, I'm, um, 
sorry. I am uh, here giving you a picture from uh, Linda Kaufman and Starobinsky. This is from 97. Um, what they observe is that you have, at the end of inflation, you have many oscillations. And every time the inflatone crosses the minimum of this potential, you have a phenomenal particle production. If these particles are bosons, you can have actually an announcement of the production because of Bose statistics. So this is, look, notice this is the log of the occupation number. And um, you see that you have all these steps here. This means each step is one event of particle production. The inflaton oscillates once around the bottom of its potential and boom, it goes up and then goes up and it goes on average exponentially up. There are some moments where it doesn't go up in the case in which you have destructive interference. You are producing new waves that are interfering destructively with the existing ones and the occupation number can go down, but statistically this will happen less, less often than going up. And at some point, you remember that, uh, um, where am I? Here, so the number of particles produced goes one over m dot, m dot is proportional to phi dot, at some point, phi dot just becomes too small and you are not producing particles anymore because the amplitude of the instant oscillations are decreasing and uh, the process plateaus. But you see in this simple example, they get an occupation number that is e to the 40, it's pretty large. Um, so the, this was the first important observations that was made. Um, the time scale in which this happens is 10, 20, 30 inflaton oscillations, usually reheating, that is the perturbative decay of the inflaton occurs in 10 to 8, 10 to 10 inflaton oscillations. So this phenomenon happens much more quickly, is much more violent than the usual perturbative decay of let's say one quantum of the inflaton into two fermions or whatever. Um, and this is why this process was called preheating because it happens before reheating and in a sense is the preparation to reheating. Um, there's a second very important thing to notice. And by the way, this is, uh, you can do the same thing with fermions also. Um, with fermions is even better because the mass, well, we'll talk about fermions later. Um, uh, the, the other thing that is important is that, let me go back again to this formula. Oops. Here. There is a large production of particles as long as their energy is smaller than m dot, as long as their momentum is m dot. m in this case, for instance, for the fermion, m dot is g phi dot. Phi dot, if you have ordinary inflation, phi is order Planck mass, phi dot is order mass of the inflaton time, time Planck mass. This is a very large mass. So you can produce particles that are way heavier than uh, the inflaton mass. You see, in this plot, this is taken by, the, by a paper by Giudice, uh, Peloso, Riot, and Kachoff. This was with fermions. This parameter Q is essentially G squared, this coupling constant times 10 to the 10, not so important. The important thing is that, you know, I can produce a sizable amount of these X particles, these fermions, for that have mass that is like 10 to three, 10 to four, the mass of the inflaton. So this means that you can end up producing particles that would be uh, impossible to produce if you are just looking at perturbative decay of the inflaton. Perturbatively, the, decay, the inflaton can decay only in particles that are, you know, half its weight or less. So this, and basically this is due to the fact that we have a collective effect of all these infrared modes that are all oscillating in the same way, and all together they can pump up a lot of energy. But it only um, works because your particle is unnaturally light, right? Because if you have the coupling um, allowed, why, why uh, is it maybe small? I mean, if, if you yes. have, yeah, it's, it's very strange. I mean, if the experiments are chiral, there's a good reason there that, that they are light, then you cannot have no coupling G phi. Otherwise, you are looking at a fine tuned scenario. Absolutely. Correct. Okay. Um, there's nothing I have to say about it. Good. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, actually, no, there's one thing I have to say about this. Um, for the first half of this presentation, 
I will not care about naturalness. Okay. I will for the second half. No, no, it's fine. It's fine. Um, but, and I mean, I will not care because that's things, you know, even this is, you know, golden era of supersymmetry, you know, the late 90s, early 2000s, uh, people weren't really caring too much about naturalness when they were doing this kind of analysis. Um, so one can make a lot, a lot of uh, um, phenomenological applications here. Um, for instance, one, because, because the particles can be much heavier than inflaton. Uh, you know, there's papers when people started talking about generation of super heavy dark matter. Dark matter could be 10 to 15, 10 to 16 GeV. Baryogenesis. Um, Are you, and by this, uh, yep. Um, apart from naturalness, but this would require also the coupling G to be reasonably large, right? That I mean, it appears an M dot also. Doesn't that cause troubles with the loop corrections to the inflaton potential? Potentially, it does. It does. It does. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. This is stuff people weren't considering. Uh, absolutely. Um, you, you know, maybe things are fine tuned. You know, there, there's a lot of people, unfortunately, that are starting to think about it uh, now. But back then, the situation was just different. They, they just didn't care at this point. Um, I mean, I believe there is still a regime of parameters where loop corrections are small and you can have a sizable effect. But to be honest, they just didn't care. Um, so super heavy dark matter, baryogenesis, and by this I really referring to gut baryogenesis. You know, gut baryogenesis uh, would have required the gut particles to be produced. If reheating temperature is too low, you cannot produce uh, gut particles. Uh, but this way, you could still have low reheating temperature, relatively low reheating temperature, but produce a little bit of very heavy gut, gut barium violating particles or leptogenesis, same story. <coughs> so some applications here. There was another interesting application, um, and I'm really happy to, uh, to have to talk about this in front of Peter, and I don't know if Marco arrived. Um, so um, there was a concern about the so-called dangerous relics. So what are dangerous relics? In uh, string theory or string motivated models or sugra, su sugra motivated models or sugra models, one often have as particles that are reasonably heavy, maybe TV scale um, and very long lived. They decay gravitationally if they decay at all. Um, so if you produce too many of those particles, you are in trouble. Uh, if they are stable because they overclose the universe, this is what I wrote in this slide. So that means that since you have all these non-relativistic particles around, the universe becomes matter-dominated before it actually became matter-dominated. If they decay, they often decay after uh, nucleosynthesis. And when they decay, they emit photons that are very high energy photons that photo dissociate the nucleosynthesis products. And so they mess up with nucleosynthesis. So in general, you don't want to have too many of these guys around. And there was a concern that, uh, you know, these particles are ubiquitous in these models. And one uh, can have a worry that you are producing too many of those. And maybe there are constraints or even ruled out things. And the, the, the result, and this is work uh, by Peter and Marco and, and myself, you know, I was a grad student there and great memories of this, sorry, but I have to talk about it. Uh, so the, the conclusion was that this is extremely, extremely model dependent. Um, so there was in particular a statement about supergravity models. That is the, the strong, you know, the, I would say the sharpest statement you can make because, you know, n equal four, uh, sorry, n equal one, d equal four, supergravity is a sufficiently well constrained theory. And the concern was basically the following uh, if you have inflation, the inflaton breaks supersymmetry, the expectation value of the inflaton breaks supersymmetry. And the break, supersymmetry breaking is associated to generation of a mass for the gravitino. So 
And at very high energies, the, 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 the longitudinal component of the gravitino is the Golstino. And the Golstino, in this case, is the super part of the supersymmetry breaking object, that is the inflaton. So the gravitino is essentially the inflatino. If the inflaton is oscillating, and the inflaton has some supersymmetric coupling to itself, some coupling to itself that in general you expect to have, you expect to have a large production of inflatinos, but these inflatinos are gravitinos. And you would say, well, you are producing a lot of gravitinos. And again, these gravitinos really fall into this uh, category of um, uh, dangerous relics. As I say, this is the, you know, when you try to go into the string theory construction, things get way more model dependent, your moduli, you don't know where they are, you don't know where they come from. This is a very constrained setup. But what we could show uh, was that even in that very constrained setup, um, the gravitino production doesn't depend only on the inflaton dynamics, but it depends also on what is the gravitino today. Because during inflation, the gravitino was mostly inflatino, but today the gravitino is the super partner of whoever is breaking supersymmetry now. It is not necessarily the inflaton. So there's an extra degree of, um, of um, arbitrariness there, <coughs> given by the fact that uh, the amount of gravitino produced doesn't depend only on the model of inflation, but it depends on, on, also on the pattern of supersymmetry breaking in vacuum, and also on how the inflaton couples to the fields that are breaking SUSY in vacuum now. So things are extremely model dependent, doesn't mean that this never happens, but it's not compulsory, which brings me actually to the next Sorry, is, there, of, is, there, yes. is there a simple way? Is there a simple way to parametrically understand when preheating happens and when not? I mean, in terms of couplings. If I have, for an outsider, is there kind of have a, some rule telling me when the conditions will be such that I just decay and when there will be preheating? Yes. Uh, if you have, you can parameterize your mass as some m dot m of t. You can write some effective mass m of t. You can find the minimum of that mass. You can compute, so the value of T at which that mass is minimum. You can compute the derivative of the mass, M dot at the time, and you compare it with the Hubble parameter. If that ratio is much larger than the Hubble parameter squared, then preheating is occurring. M dot That's the simplest bigger, parametric M, way of doing it. M dot larger than H squared. M dot larger than M squared. Okay. Which, by the way, since M dot sets the UV cutoff, this is telling you you're producing modes that are much shorter than the, than the Hubble radius. I so see. that your analysis is really Minkowski. I see. OK, thank you. Huh? Could, could, could I ask a question? Uh, because I've seen recently some pa papers uh, about the Cravitino landscape uh, conjectures and so on. Is, is that related? Is that related to these questions? I don't know. I'm sorry. I really well, there have know. been papers by, yeah, Kolb, Rocky Kolb, right? Rocky Kolb and. Uh, oh yeah, I I, I downloaded it. Uh, I downloaded it. I couldn't read it yet. I I have to read it, and I I'm pretty sure I have to write to Rocky. Well, I I, I don't know. I I, I haven't looked carefully added, but it looks to me that they are bringing up this stuff again now, 20 years later. Uh, yes. And they call yes. it a, a landscape and swamp land discussion or what? Yes, okay. absolutely. Um, I haven't looked at it. I mean, this is the stuff that goes on YouTube. I will not tell you what my personal life is now. I just, <laughs> it's on the list of things that are really high in my priority list, but it's just, um, I, I'm planning, I mean, it's, it's, Relevant, I think. Okay. But I couldn't read the paper carefully enough to be able to draft an email. I was I actually very surprised it. reading the paper because they derive a, a UV constraint, a swampland constraint, from something happening in the IR. To me, that can't be true. If something strange happens in the IR, it doesn't make the model UV inconsistent. But that's what they claim. So I was very confused when reading it. Yeah, I, I I'm sorry. Uh, you know, it's. It's on my, you know, if there's a paper I really care about, it's I send an email to myself. I ended up that, that, that many emails to myself, but that is the one I'm caring about that I couldn't read it. <laughs> so you should Sorry. answer emails you're writing to. Me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, that's the only, you know, if it's not in my email, it doesn't exist. For no, me, so. I, I don't know. Maybe Marco, Marco has, has had a look at it, but I don't know. I, I, it's definitely no, very high in my list of priorities. We could discuss that. Good. Thank you. Yeah. No, no. Well, sorry that I couldn't answer this. Um, okay. Um, so, wow. I'm going slowly as usual. Um, okay. So um, let me start talking about particle production during inflation. So I, I think the main message of particle production and preheating is that yes, it's an interesting phenomenon. Yes, is in many cases unavoidable, but also is extremely model dependent. And also, you know, the details of the process are often lost in the thermalization of the decay products. So, you know, there's not a ton of signatures that are there. Uh, one signature that would be there would be with gravitational waves because the gravitational waves never thermalize. But we're talking about extremely high frequency gravitational waves. This is processes that are happening at very short land scales. So, um, you know, where this, these are land scales that typically correspond today to one meter. So, when we will be able to measure gravitational waves that are one meter wavelength, then we, we might be able to do this. But most effects are not testable. And so, but some, this is why I'm moving to inflation because on the other hand, during inflation, things that happen during inflation leave an imprint in the CMB that we can test much better. So that's the idea. And now instead of having the inflaton falling down and producing maybe many times particles, there's something that is happening here. Um, and that we can see at large scale observables. Okay. So two slides on inflaton perturbations. And again, uh, you know, going to Arthur's question, I will not care here about Bogolyubov coefficients or other things. I'm just going to tell you the standard story. The standard story doesn't care about renormalizing UV modes. And as I said, if you want to do that using this adiabatic subtraction procedure, things are, to say the least, unclear. OK? Um, so. If you forget about renormalizing, uh, you just you know, take the inflaton, you decompose it into a homogeneous part, and in homogeneous part, you quantize the inhomogeneous part. You will work in conformal time, where the scale factor is given by this expression, and tau goes from minus infinity to minus one over h, because we declare that inflation ends when the scale factor is equal to one. And uh, one can write equation. This is the general equation for motion. It is still of the form uh, with this omega squared. And here is precisely the point. Beware, omega square here becomes tachyonic at some point. So uh, definition of positive and negative frequency components is not obvious for a tachyonic field. Um, but if we forget about this definition of positive and negative frequency components, uh, you can just solve this equation of motion for a pure de Sitter background, you get this result. And then the power spectrum of metric perturbation is given by this expression. And for late times, so tau goes to zero, if you want for k tau goes to zero. So for k and the end of inflation tau is said is one over h minus one over h. So for k over h goes to zero large scales. This term here dominates over this one. The, and the power spectrum goes to this famous constant, okay? Notice on the other hand that if I were to consider scales that are well inside the horizon, I would have k cube, and in this case, this term would be negligible. I would have just one over k for delta phi squared. So this thing would go as k squared. This is the UV divergence I was talking about. Uh, we just ignore it. It is beside the horizon. We don't care about it now. Um, OK, so uh, in this paper, that as far as I know is the first paper where they talked about particle production during inflation, they made this consideration. They said, Suppose I have this inflaton. Now this mass parameter, um, this thing here, if it crosses zero, this is for a fermion. If this thing here crosses zero during inflation, I will have an explosive production of particle sky. For a scalar species, I would have to write this Lagrangian that is slightly more finely tuned because I'm assuming that effective mass crosses zero here. In general, we'd have some other plus another mass squared plus this stuff. Um, this paper has a title Probing Planckian Physics. 
because they say if G is of order one and phi during inflation is of order five, 10 Planck masses, then this stuff crosses zero when the, this mass parameter is of order one, uh, this is of order Planck mass. If this is the end of the story, this Lagrangian, then when phi is equal to zero, this is a particle that today would be Planckian mass. Notice that, however, during inflation, this particle is light or relatively light in the time where we are studying it. So the effective theory might make sense. Modulo, of course, is usual, these questions of loop corrections. So this thing crosses the M over G during inflation. And so I'm producing a lot of these chi particles during inflation. The question is, what do I see? You know, I'm having a production of inhomogeneous mode during inflation that can leave a signature on, in particular, the metric perturbations that are leaving the horizon at that point. So there are four kinds of effects one can think of. First effect, I'm producing a lot of particles. These particles have an energy and they will leave an imprint in the CMB. Well, the chi particles themselves don't matter a lot because if I go back here, you'll see that this stuff crosses zero. But then if phi keeps rolling, this stuff becomes large again. So these particles very quickly become very heavy. As they become very heavy, they redshift away, their energy redshift away, so they leave no imprint in the CMB or anything like that. The phenomenon that was studied in this paper was actually the fact that since the particles are produced, they have to take energy from somewhere. Where's the only possible energy available is from the zero mode of the inflaton that is rolling. You know, so it's basically from phi dot squared. That's the only part of energy in the inflaton that is available. So since I'm producing particles, phi dot gets smaller, slows down. Since the power spectrum is proportional to one over phi dot squared, I will have a feature in the power spectrum because of uh, this change in phi dot. Um, these are plots from their um, paper. This is the original power spectrum in their model. And you see, well, there is a little slope because this is m square phi square. So the power spectrum is not exactly scale invariant, but almost. And then at some point you have particle production and this corresponds to a dip in phi dot. But phi dot is in the denominator. So it corresponds to a peak in the power spectrum. And then in the CMB, this would give something like this, depending on where this thing is happening. Notice this is a paper from 99, well before WMAP, well before Planck. Um, so, you know, back then it was conceivable that you could have a bump this large, now we cannot. Also notice, however, that they are assuming that they have 100 fermion species because they want to crank up the, crank up the effect. Um, so this means that you could have signatures in the CMB. Um, <coughs> also, um, there were subsequent works focusing mostly on the scalar theory that I showed, but with the same philosophy. You could have two other phenomena. You could have a phenomenon of backscattering, that is one quantum of chi scatter off the zero mode of the inflaton and knocks out one quantum of inflaton. So this is the first phenomenon. Although, so you could have two quantum of chi annihilated into two quantum of inflaton. Um, and it turns out that um, the, this effect for a scalar theory, this effect is the dominant one and gives a correction to the power spectrum that is given by this expression. And I didn't plot things, but this is, you know, some function of the momentum that gives some oscillating effect. This effect is actually much larger than the one that was represented uh, here is parametrically larger. Notice that we factored out this term, G phi dot divided by H squared. That's exactly the non adiabaticity parameter Arthur was asking about, you know, the stuff that has to be much larger than one, G phi dot divided by H squared here. Um, and so this gives a feature in the power spectrum. Now, if I take, and people have been looking for those features. And uh, you know, I'm taking a quote from the Planck 2015 inflation paper that says, blah, blah, blah. They do a complete analysis. They find some mild evidence. Um, but it's so mild that they say that the simplicity of the power law spectrum continues to give it an edge over more complicated initial spectra and the most plausible explanation for the apparent feature 
in the data remains that we are just observing fluctuations due to cosmic variance. So as far as I know, there's no signature of this, but people have been looking a lot. Um, there's another interesting thing. Um, the scalar perturbations, the, if, if I take, sorry, the statistics of fluctuations generated by some um, perturbation of some otherwise free field are Gaussian. Um, and indeed, for instance, in the case of the inflaton, we measure Gaussianity and we find, you know, we measure what is the probability of finding a fluctuation up or down with the energy density in our universe in the fluctuations. And we find the Gaussian distribution that is Gaussian to one part in about 10 to four, depending on how you measure it. Um, but however, the effects we are considering like scattering processes are generally non-Gaussian. For instance, I'm, the, I'm producing two quanta of chi. These two quanta of chi, each of them follows a Gaussian distribution. But then if the two quanta of chi scatter and produce one or two, one quantum of uh, phi, that quantum of phi obeys a non-Gaussian statistics. So in general, these models predict that the features in the power spectrum are non-Gaussian, but this is extremely poor, poorly con uh, constrained. One important thing uh, we heard about um, non-Gaussianity is uh, on Monday in particular, uh, the best constraints on non-Gaussianity come from what is the so-called local non-Gaussianity that is non-Gaussian that, that corresponds to three point functions in which one of the moment, two of the momenta are much larger than the third momentum. But usually these processes correspond to phenomena that happen inside the horizon and so non gaussianity corresponds to what is known as the equilateral type. That is the, the highest amount of non gaussianity come from three point function where the momenta are more or less of the same order of magnitude. That are more weakly constrained from uh, um, cosmology observations. Um, I've been talking for 56 minutes. Uh, probably is a good time to stop unless there are questions looks like no questions so um as i said uh, um before um so if we have this events of particle production during inflation one effect is out of energy conservation just the inflaton is slowed down in its rolling uh, there was a paper uh, by Kaufman, Linda, Liu, Maloney, McAllister in 2004 titled Beauty is Attractive, where they were arguing, for instance, that if I have a point in field space where there are a, you know, point of enhanced symmetry, so points where in my field space there are some fields that become um, massless, then if the inflaton is passing by one of those points will be you know, it, it will lead to production of these particles that become massless. And in doing this, it will lose energy and eventually uh, will start oscillating around that point. In particular, in this example, um, you know, the mass is proportional to the distance of the inflaton. This is a complex inflaton in this case, um, the distance of the inflaton from the origin. So there's an attractor towards the direction where the inflaton is just going in a circular motion around the field so that the mass stays constant. Every time the mass changes a lot, I have particle production, the inflaton loses its energy. Um, and um, this is in absence of universe expansion. And the, the, but the thing I really want to discuss more because it will matter for what I'm gonna discuss later is the so-called idea of trapped inflation. So the idea is the following, oops. What happens if, um, um, what happens if I have a situation where the, there are many nearby points of enhanced symmetries, some points phi i, so that every time the inflaton crosses phi i, it produces quanta of the field chi i. So we were talking about one event of particle production. Now we're talking about many events of particle production. And the idea is in this case that every time the inflaton produces particles is slowed down then it starts only again, produces new particles, it slows down. And if these events of particle production are sufficiently close to each other, 
one can get an inflaton that is moving at almost constant velocity. And this would allow you to um, obtain inflation even if the inflaton potential is relatively steep, uh, as we you know we heard yesterday at, at length. You know, one thing that we need to do sometimes is to have one thing we, we want to do during inflation is to have flat potentials. And uh, if the potential is not flat, <coughs> then this kind of situation can work <coughs> because the inflaton is slowed down now, not because of Hubble friction, not because the universe is expanding, but because of this phenomenon of particle production. Again, you might object, uh, wait, how about radiative stability? And they, and they would say, sorry, I don't know. Okay, I will talk later about something where hopefully radiative stability is in much better control, but then we have other problems. So this was proposed by these people in 2009 and uh, it's called trapped inflation. So in principle, it allows you to have inflation on a steep potential. There are many conditions that must be satisfied and the performing an analysis of the parameter space of this model is long and complicated. First of all, you want to have inflation you want to have inflation to last 60 foldings. You also want to be in a regime where you don't need, you don't have ordinary slow roll inflation. Otherwise you don't need trapped inflation. You just have slow roll inflation and you're happy. Uh, we have this condition of quick particle production that uh, we were mentioning before, G phi dot much smaller than, uh, much larger than H square. Also the decay products must not annihilate too quickly. This doesn't mean that otherwise inflation doesn't happen, but we don't trust the calculation for perturbations if they do. And uh, we want many productions per folding. Otherwise, our inflaton will go down by steps. And uh, by do going down by steps, we would have you know, a power spectrum that would be irregular. So, and, and this is only to impose that this thing is working. Then we have to make sure that actually the data, the, you know, the predicted number match the, the observed data. So, um, well, Marco is here now. So Lauren Pierce and Marco and myself, we did a more detailed analysis of the analysis they had before. I will tell you later why we wanted to do it. Uh, so I am quoting the results actually from our analysis because I understand them better. And I also trust some of those numbers better. Um, but the qualitative result is more or less the same. So. This is an expression for a power spectrum. As you see, the power spectrum has no, you know, the expression for a power spectrum is completely different from the one you had for ordinary inflation. Um, there, the spectral index, this is the first point where you're starting actually to have troubles. Um, if we assume a monomial potential for the inflaton, it turns out that the spectral index in general will depend to this parameter delta that we have to impose if delta is equal to zero, the spectral index doesn't match observations. This is always too close to one. So in order to have it match observations, we must say that the delta, because I didn't tell you what it was, but I showed it in the picture. Delta is the distance between two near by moments of particle production. So the distance between two, no, phi, phi one and phi two or phi two and phi three. Delta cannot be constant. It has to go at uh, some power of the field. And turns out that this power must be minus three or minus five, more or less, to match observation. So this is a complication in the construction. This is a special for non-Gaussianities. As I mentioned before, non-Gaussianities are equilateral. And uh, this actually strongly limits the parameter space. The amplitude of tensor modes is unchanged and we don't care. Actually, just we don't see gravitational waves here, which is consistent with the fact that we're actually not observing gravitational waves from inflation. Uh, so this is the parameter space from their paper. When we did our paper, the parameter space changed a little bit its shape, but the main message was the same. So you see all these lines. These are all the constraints you are imposing just to be able to do the analysis. And there are the main constraints that are the following. This red line here, just is imposing that you actually have inflation. And so you have to be below this line. You have to be above this blue line to satisfy the non-Gaussianity condition. Um, sorry, that you have inflation. This line here is to have slow roll inflation, even 
because due to trapping and not due to the fact that the potential is flat. This dashed line that is basically identical to the blue line is corresponds to the regime where the inflaton is larger than Planck mass. Now, the main motivation for this model, I was saying, was to get a flat potential, to obtain inflation with a flat potential. If the field phi is larger than the Planck mass, the potential is already flattish by itself. So, and also, you know, we heard a lot about swampland, you know, fields larger than Planck mass are not very popular in the swampland. Uh, those are the fields that are really constrained by the swampland. So the region in which you would be compatible with swampland and observations would be this teeny tiny line between the dashed line and the purple line that you see is negligibly small. So there's really not a lot of space left for this model. Still, it's an important reference point for the physics behind it. Okay. If this is also a microscopic realization of something that was um, now introduced many years before, the idea of warm inflation. The idea of warm inflation was that the inflaton is in interaction with the thermal bath. Um, but the description of warm inflation was always really um, neglecting all the microphysics. There was just an assumption that the inflaton would dissipate some energy into a thermal bath and would be in thermal equilibrium with the thermal bath. But the microphysics, again, was unclear, which was leaving, leading to a lot of model dependence. This model of trapped inflation represents, in a sense, a microscopic realization of warm inflation. The extra ingredient, of course, in warm inflation is that you have a thermal bath, while the stuff I was discussing now is not thermalized. But you can assume that it's thermalized, uh, that it thermalizes. Uh, still, constraints are strong. OK. Now, I'm going to move on. <clears throat> this is really part two. two. So, up to now, I really talked about masses of particles changing over time. Um, there's a very strong motivation uh, to have an inflaton that is a pseudoscalar and this shift symmetric axioms. Um, and uh, as we heard yesterday, there's uh, many um, proposals to realize, even in UV complete theories, models where the inflaton is an axiom like degree of freedom. Um, and uh, what I'm going to focus on is a natural coupling of the inflaton phi that is a pseudoscalar shift symmetric to gauge fields. And I'm going to focus on the U1 gauge field case. Um, so I'm going to parameterize this coupling here. Oh, and I have already an inconsistency in my slides, sorry, as alpha over f. Of course, I, you know, since alpha and f appear only once in this formula, I could have just called this one over f, but I will call it, I will still use it alpha over f for later convenience. Um, so the idea is the following. <coughs> if I have a electromagnetic field with a coupling to the inflaton here, um, if the inflaton phi is a constant, uh, then this term here is a total derivative. It doesn't contribute to the equations of motion. But the inflaton is not a constant. And so when I write equations of motion for the helicity lambda modes of the photon, so they compose the photon, uh, the gauge field uh, in, uh, I, I go to a Coulomb gauge and I decompose it into left-handed and right-handed components. And I get this equation where there should be an alpha here in front of this. So as you see, this is phi prime, this is the, conformal time derivative of the inflaton. And what I discover is that this object here has this term here that it contains a lambda. Lambda is the sign of the elicity. So depending on the sign of phi dot, one of the two elicities actually crosses for sufficiently small momenta, crosses zero and becomes stachyonic. Which means that I can have an exponential amplification of the mode functions of one of the gauge fields. Uh, in the light of the discussion we had before, uh, you know, I'm still going to talk this particle production, even if it is really a field amplification, because again, we are not talking about uh, we are not talking about modes that are, you know, with real frequencies that are in the regime we are interested in. They are imaginary frequencies. But one can perform a, an analysis of this. And as I said, you know, for lambda negative, the mass term here becomes negative. It is large for about one Hubble time. Then, you know, this is a phi prime. So derivative with respect to conformal time, which really means that this goes as one over 
the scale factor and you know as the time goes on this term becomes um, less relevant um, and um, this leads turns out to lead the exponential amplification of only the left-handed or only the right-handed modes of the photon um, which mode is amplified depends on the sign of phi dot okay um, I will call it left-handed for for definiteness uh, this is a sign of parity violation since the inflaton is parity odd turns out that it generates only modes of a given carrarity of the photon which is also parity odd um, and you you see it's exponential and it's exponential in phi dot divided by your fh this quantity here you know as we heard yesterday f better be smaller than Planck masks Phi dot, if the inflaton is taking Planckian values, phi dot goes more or less as a slow roll times square root of slow roll parameter that is you know, typically of order 0.1 times H times Planck mass. So the stuff goes as something like 0.1 Planck mass divided by F. Since F is smaller than Planck mass, this number is naturally large. And since it is an exponential, it's very large. So, this leads to a host of possible observable effects and you know, we had a lot of fun uh, we meaning a lot of people had a lot of fun looking at all these possible things so one first obvious thing one would think of is you know this is a gauge field maybe this is actually the u1 hypercharge of a standard model and uh, maybe this can lead to generation of cosmological magnetic fields these fields are observed at large cosmological scales up to megaparsec scales we don't know where they come from turns out that in this simple model the power spectrum of these gauge fields is very blue it goes as k squared which leads to a weak field at large scales and this is despite some magneto magneto hydrodynamics phenomenon known as inverse cascade that is occurring for gauge fields that have a definite helicity and these ones have a definite helicity and that has the effect of raising power at large scales actually but doesn't raise it enough so as it is it doesn't work uh, we worked out some correction but i'm not some possible modification to the model but i'm not going to discuss those um, uh, another possible effect um, uh, is the possibility that since we are having a non valency uh, natalicity for again a U1 hypercharged field, uh, biogenesis right at the end of inflation? Um, I, I have these two papers here, Amber Sabancilar, that I believe is the first one. Um, um, there's a detailed work by Valerie and collaborators. And basically, the result is that you easily get a lot of biogenesis. Actually, you know, typically you get even too much of it. Um, I will not go ahead in this direction too, but that's another possibility. One thing I like to focus on is the possibility of uh, chiral gravitational waves. Basically, our universe in this scenario, we are having a rolling inflaton that is producing gauge fields. The gauge fields are diluted away at the same pace at which they are produced. So I have a steady population of gauge fields. And the delay uh, regime of validity we are considering, we are neglecting possibility that these gauge fields, for instance, interact with each other significantly. And uh, if these gauge fields, however, you know, this population of gauge fields is an additional source of gravitational waves. And these gravitational waves will be preferentially chiral. Why? Because if I have two quanta of my gauge fields that are left-handed and they fuse to create one gravitational wave, especially in the regime in which these two quanta are almost collinear, then the gravitational wave is also going to be left-handed because of angular momentum conservation. Um, so one can compute the amplitude of the gravitational waves in this model. And let me show. So in this case, you have a power spectrum for the left-handed gravitational waves and the power spectrum for the right-handed gravitational wave. And each of these guys has two terms. A first term that is the standard one, the one here. This is what you would get in any case. Gravitational waves are amplified from the vacuum exactly the same way as the inflaton fluctuations are amplified from the vacuum. And this, are, this is the amplitude of gravitational waves 
produced by photon photon scattering. So uh, let me spend two minutes on this. This parameter Xi is this measure alpha phi dot divided by two FH, as I said, is larger than one or so. Uh, if it's not larger than one, these expressions, of course, don't work because you see this blows up for Xi goes to zero and clearly this is not a regime of validity of this approximation. Uh, but the important thing is that this is exponentially large here. The other thing is that parity violation is given by the fact that these two coefficients are different from each other. And I always like to use this you know, uh, for students as a cautionary remark. This 10 to minus seven and 10 to minus nine are not results of any parameters. These are numbers, numbers that you obtain with putting you know, twos and pies, et cetera. So I always like to stress that you know, putting two pi equal to one sometimes can give you big trouble. You know, because the fact that this number is 10 to minus six actually matters. Um, so you can have a population of chiral gravitational waves that then can lead to interesting signatures that I will not discuss now, but I will discuss soon. Because before discussing this, I have to discuss a paper by uh, Neil Barnaby and Marco um, that focused on uh, the effect that the same photons would have had on the scalar power spectrum. So as you remember, I said that when you have uh, particle production, um, I mean, you have um, two particles producing, let's say a quantum of the inflaton and this, this quantum of the inflaton being stressed by inflation and becoming basically one cosmological perturbation, that statistics is non-Gaussian because it's basically the square of a Gaussian statistics. Um, so what uh, Neil and Marco did was to compute the FNL parameter that measures the non-Gaussianity in the equilateral limit, and also to compute the corrections to the scalar power spectrum. And um, here <coughs> on the horizontal axis, I have this F divided by alpha in units of Planck mass, okay? And on the vertical axis here, I'm plotting the tensor to scalar ratio. And here I am plotting the parameter FNL. So if F is sufficiently large, which corresponds to a weak coupling of the gauge field, nothing happens. In this region, the tensor to scalar ratio is the one you're having for ordinary inflation. This is with monomial inflation, phi to the one or phi to the two. Uh, but then as F gets smaller, at some point here, you're starting contributing to the scalar perturbations and to the tensor perturbations. It turns out that actually the contribution to the scalar perturbations is larger than one to the tensor perturbations. And uh, this is effectively lowering the tensor to scalar ratio. So at large F actually, the tensor to scalar ratio becomes smaller, which would be okay. Actually, you know, would be better in a sense because we are not observed gravitational waves. But on the other hand, it increases also this FNL parameter. And uh, you know, when you get to saturation, when you get to the point where these effects are interesting, then, uh, the, then FNL is about 8,000, if I remember correctly, that is uh, ruled out by observations by a long stretch. So this model, as it is, is ruled out. Uh, can we do something useful with it? Well, yes. So there's a, a first con consideration that you can do is that is the following. The constraints on non-Gaussianities come only from uh, um, CMB scales. But this, <coughs> this process could be going on also at later scales. It uh, is in general going on also for the whole duration of inflation. So let's go look back at the uh, expression for this, uh, for the power spectra. And you see, as I noticed before, this goes as e to the four pi xi. So, and xi is proportional to phi dot over h. And over, during inflation, phi dot increases, h decreases. So xi dot get, xi gets larger and larger and larger during inflation, which leads to an amplification of this power spectrum of gravitational waves as we go to smaller scales. So you could have a regime where during inflation, Xi is small enough that you don't have problems with non-Gaussianities, but then towards the end of inflation, you produce so many gravitational waves that they could be detectable 
by gravitational wave interferometers like LISGO or LISA that operate at, of course, much shorter wavelengths than the cosmological wavelengths. Um, and I'm putting here also a plot uh, from another paper by Marco and uh, Neil and Enrico Payer. Um, this is, for instance, the power spectrum of the gravitational waves in uh, the model, um, I believe this is just op equal to one, so phi to the one. So let me go back one in, important thing to say before I go ahead. This evolution of psi, of course, depends on the detail of the inflationary potential later on. So you can play now with inflationary potential at smaller scales to get uh, you know, different effects. Um, so this is for just a linear potential. And uh, this is for value of psi at CMB scales that are small enough that you don't see any effect on the on non-Gaussianities. Um, but then, as and so if nothing happened, this would be the spectrum of gravitational waves produced during inflation. And it would be way below the sensitivity of uh, LISA, advanced LIGO, or Einstein telescope that are you know, either existing or projected um, detectors of gravitational waves. But uh, because of this effect, on the other hand, the contribution of gravitational waves, it gets increasing, increasing, increasing. And it can get high here or even better here. You will notice that it goes up and then it kind of plateaus here. And this is because here we get into the strong back reaction regime. This is a regime where the photons energy back react strongly on the inflating background, complicating things a lot. Um, I will talk about it soon. Um, so that's one possibility. Another possibility uh, that is interesting and gives interesting phenomenology uh, if you want to have effects at the level of CMB is the possibility that there is that the inflaton that the gauge field coupled to the photons is not the inflaton but is some other axion. And one can assume the axion to have this kind of potential that is a nice axion axionic potential. Um, and this axion might start at the top of its hill and then at some point just roll down at the bottom of the hill during inflation. And this phenomenon can happen relatively quickly during you know, two, three foldings of inflation, which means that in this case, sigma that is coupled to the photons would be rolling only during a short amount of time. You will be producing photons only during a short amount of time. You will get a feature in the amount of photons. Uh, and if, for instance, you could have a situation where these photons are producing scalar quanta and gravitational waves, let's say for modes where L in the CL of the CMB are of the order of say one to 100. At this L, this is the region where we are actually measuring gravitational waves from the CMB in the mean modes. On the other hand, the temperature fluctuations contain a large intrinsic error because of cosmic variance. So you could have that, yeah, you're producing a lot of scalar modes, but they are swamped by co cosmic variance and you don't see their effects, while the effect of gravitational waves are visible. And um, here I'm plotting some parameters for some plots for this. So this is for some choice, the red, green, and blue, or some, for chance, some choices or parameters, this is not so important. This is the effect on the CMB power spectrum that is measured by Planck. And as you see, all these red, green, and blue curves are all in good agreement with data. Yeah, you have a big bump here in the red one, but it's still within, well within the error bars given by cosmic variance. On the other hand, we could have a, an important possibility of detection in the B modes. So, uh, this is small, but the dotted line corresponds here to R equal to the, to the standard spectrum of gravitational waves is R was equal to 0.1. So this is actually ruled out now by, um, by Planck and Keck. This gray one is 10 to minus two. So this is, you know, we're close to 
test in this, this is 10 to minus three for R. And these are the effects of the bumps on these gravitational waves. For instance, we could fake here a tensor to scalar ratio of almost 10 to minus two, even if actually the tensors are really small. And we could see them here, yep, um, but not here, for instance. And Arthur has a question. Uh, yeah, I, I would be interested in the parameters because I, I would like to understand uh, how natural it is from a fundamental string theory perspective. What is F and what is lambda for this to be? Oh, yeah. Well, it's, um, I think from a string theory point of view, I believe it's reasonably natural. I don't remember the exact numbers, but F is well below Planckian because we want this transient not to last for a lot of time. And lambda, the height of the potential, has to be, you know, a fraction of the energy in the inflaton because you don't want to see the energy in this guy itself, but it's not ridiculously smaller than this. So I, I now I don't remember the exact numbers, but I, I could say, you know, lambda might be in the order of I don't know, ten to thirteen GV, and f of the order of, you know, well, f. Yeah, it's difficult to read f from these parameters, but uh, it's uh, it's. Um, F must be in the order of uh, what 10 to the usual 10 to 16, 10 to 5, 15 GV, I would say. So it doesn't need to uh, be excessively small. That's my worry. No, 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 no. Doesn't need to be excessively small. The thing that is fine tuned, of course, is that it must happen that this thing starts rolling exactly when the observable scales are leading the horizon. Yeah, and now, when does this moment, thing yeah. starts rolling? Mm -hmm. When the Hubble parameter, because during inflation, the Hubble parameter is decreasing. When the Hubble parameter crosses the mass of this guy, the guy starts rolling. So that, the fine tuning is really there. You really need the Hubble parameter to cross the lambda square, lambda square divided by F when uh, uh, the relevant scales are leaving the horizon. Could, could it not be and that there are many axions? I mean, if there's, if there's something like an axiverse, there could be many axions with various scales, and maybe then it could be. Absolutely. Absolutely. Natural. Absolutely. But of there course, you need, be you need the axions. Those... But you need them to couple, uh, to, you need them to couple to an abelian group, right? So the lambda comes from instantons or from some non abelian confinement scale. So, and yeah, lambda could... comes from instantons or non abelian confinement scale, uh, yeah. Uh, and then you want to, to, them to be coupled to an abelian group too. Yeah, so you, that's that's a necessary condition. Okay, good, thank you. Okay, yes. that's all. I mean, you need to generate a potential and they have to be coupled to an abelian group. By the way, in principle, uh, you know, the, it's a good detour. You could also talk about coupling to a non-abelian group for this or for anything else. The problem with the non-abelian cap coupling is that you have a photon-photon self-coupling that becomes very quickly important where the occupation number of these photons goes up. Mm -hmm. So unless the, the non-abelian group has a teeny tiny gauge coupling, uh, you are not gonna be able to see this because it, you know, the, the, the growth is quenched by the, the self-interactions of the photon. You is still it, will be amplifying the, the, the sorry, the Cartan's algebra. Why does it kill your effect? Why can't you, I mean, okay, so you have seven actions, sure, but why is it a problem? Because it generates a large thermal mass, if you want, an environmental mass. I see. Okay. Thank you. No problem. My pleasure. Thank you. Um, so this is, and the other interesting signature is because these things are chiral. And this is actually the thing where you would look for, in principle, for chiral gravitational waves in the CMB. So as you heard on Monday in the CMB, you have... Uh, density fluctuations or temperature fluctuations T, and then you have polarization modes and you, they are decomposed into an E mode and the B mode. And the E mode is parity even that the B mode is parity odd, which means that in a parity even uh, universe, the B T correlator should vanish. Since this system generates non chiral, uh, so it generates a parity violating population of gravitational waves, this generates a parity violating B modes, if you want. And so the BT correlator does not vanish. And so these are the spectra of the BT correlator. Um, it's, on the other hand, beyond my level of understanding in this case, what is the detectable and what is not. But actually, I believe in the paper, we had an analysis by, by Marezuke 
that was also looking at um, signal to noise for these various options. Um, so that's a lot of interesting flat, uh, observations. By the way, you know, if you were to look for B modes on a scale dependent way and you look only, suppose that the green line, suppose the red line is the one observed, the, the real one. If you look at, for B modes at L equal to five, you would think that you have a, you know, a tensor to scalar ratio that is whatever, point, point 0.05. But then if you look at it at, you know, L equal to 80, you would think that your tensor to scalar ratio is below 10 to minus three. So that's a very strong scale dependent uh, signal, which is, you know, interesting from a phenomenological point of view. Other possible um, effects. So, um, um, Lorenzo, please. hi. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so in the know. previous, yeah, yeah. In the previous slides, can I just, yes, yeah, previous slides, previous slides. Yes, sorry, yep. So this epsilon phi is the inflet on epsilon and it's 10 to minus phi and what you are plotting instead is what is uh, in answer. Sorry? So the the your the, the inflationary potential is such that epsilon Yeah, yeah. We we didn't try down an inflationary potential. We just parameterized in terms of oh. the slow roll parameters there. Okay. And what we did was precisely to choose an epsilon so small that the gravitational waves by themselves would have been yeah, small. totally unobservable. Okay, okay. So that was yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. We were just parameterizing the inflaton potential in terms of epsilon, and I don't even I don't remember even if we had uh, eta there. Uh, I think we didn't even need data. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And and delta again. So you did not. Oh, delta is a parameter that controls. I, it's a dimensional parameter that controls, I believe, the curvature of this potential around the top. Okay. I don't again. Um, Mm. And it has to be small. Yeah, they are small parameters. It's small. Uh -huh. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Thanks. So the delta is the ratio between the axiom mass and the upper rate. And this needs to be so. tuned uh, to be not much smaller than one. Ah. Because exactly. one over delta is the amount yes. of e folds during which the pseudo scalar rolls. Yeah. Thank you, Marco. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah, I also yep. vaguely remember because. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but that's, that's true. Okay. Other possible signatures. Um, and this is getting a little bit dirty now. Um, at, as I said, you can have a regime where at large scales, early times, this parameter psi is very relatively small and you don't see anything in the CMB. And then uh, as you go down, uh, as I said, you know, this parameter psi increases. And at some point you are having back reaction of the inflaton on the inflating background. I will talk about it later, hopefully. Um, um, but very quickly, you are gonna have a generation of perturbations of the inflaton there, pretty much the same perturbations that you know were in uh, Barnaby and Peloso paper I was mentioning before, but at later times. Now these perturbations can be really large. The problem is that computing the perturbations in this regime is also you know, not easy because we are talking about a regime of strong back reaction. Um, so there are a no, number of estimates. Um, I believe the first paper was this one, uh, and this one was uh, more detailed in that respect, way more detailed in that respect. Uh, and, but basically the point is this. if you generate perturbations that are too large, let's say of the order of power spectrum of the order of 1%, then these perturbations, when they come back inside the horizon, that can collapse to form primordial black holes. And there are constraints on this thing. So you cannot produce too many of those. So this can pull, generate a limit on your, on your model. And here there are two curves uh, in the case of which you have just one single family of photons or six families of photons. And the effect of the six families of photons is basically to give a one over square root of n effect and lower the overall effect as you see here. But um, this is imposing some new constraints. You know, I was saying that there are no constraints at small scales. Actually, there are constraints at small scales is overproduction of primordial black holes. Um, 
again, even with these constraints, you know, the curve can cross regions of sensitivity, for instance, of LISA. So LISA might, in principle, see this uh, gravitational waves generated this way. Um, OK, so it's a good moment. Questions here? Yeah, maybe can I ask also yeah, please. on the previous slide? So yeah, because you also had before like 2.66, point. So do you have to fine tune this side oh. to make it cross exactly? Oh, what yes. Oh. oh, yes, a lot, because oh. it's in an exponent. Right, right. So the thing is, if this weren't this primordial black hole limit, mm -hmm. you would just say, well, at some point, you know, if size is larger than a critical value, you just go into this regime uh, mm -hmm. uh, of strong back reaction and whatever happens, happens, you're going to have a ton of gravitational waves. But mm -hmm. you have to be careful not to exceed this limit. And mm -hmm. the problem is, as I will discuss now and even later, um, there's a lot of uncertainties in this regime. Mm -hmm. At the level of perturbations, and then, you know, more recently, it turns out even at the level of background dynamics. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's a difficult problem. So, <clears throat> but let me go ahead precisely in this. Uh, did I answer your question, Yvonne, by the way? Yeah, yeah, yeah. thanks. Thank uh, so maybe just what were, what were the 20, 30, and these numbers? Oh, this is the number of withholdings before the end of inflation. Ah, before the, ah, perfect. Okay, thanks. Um, so what happens if we want to put back reaction in the thing? Now I'm going to put n copies of the vector sector because I need it. Suppose the vector sector, instead of having just one photon, is many photons. Um, and then if I compute the equation of motion for the inflaton, the inflaton interacts with the gauge field. So at some point, there will be a back reaction of the gauge field on the inflaton back dynamics that I write here. And as I said, E scalar b basically goes as this exponential. So now one can have a, a different and I would claim better realization of trapped inflation in this model. Because one can get in the strong back reaction regime, a regime where, you know, in usual slow roll, you neglect this E dot b because it doesn't exist, and you neglect phi double dot. And slow roll is balancing the 3h phi dot with v prime. But in this case, you can get another regime where you are actually neglecting both phi double dot and 3h phi dot, and you are balancing v prime versus e dot b. So you could have a situation of this kind. And the interesting thing here is that, oh, e dot b goes as e to the phi dot. So if I solve for this equation, I discover that phi dot is fh divided by alpha pi times a log. And I don't even write the argument of the log because it's not very instructive. And you know, all logs are equal to 10, as we know, in cosmology. All logs are equal to one in, the, in, in physics and equal to 10 in cosmology, or minus 10. Um, so <clears throat> this means that phi dot is not controlled by the magnitude of the potential, but really controlled by f over alpha. So now I can write a potential of this form. and. With this f now, this is why I had alpha and f before now, because this f appears by itself in the potential. And again, going back to Arthur's lectures yesterday, I don't need f in this case to be larger than Planck mass, because I can actually have slow roll even with f smaller than Planck mass, even with f much smaller than Planck mass, uh, as long as uh, this phenomenon is at work. What I need it for to work, well, I need this parameter to be of the order of 10 to 3. I can actually easily say why. Um, because phi dot is fh divided by alpha. Inflation, inflation phi starts at the top of the potential and then at the end of the potential, and it travels a total in field space, space f. So if alpha was equal to 1, phi dot would travel a space f in one e folding. If I want to have 60 e foldings, I need alpha to be 60. Turns out that actually there are you know, extra parameters that conspire. And in the end, alpha is to be of the order of 1,000. Um, this, you know, people can complain and did complain about the fact that alpha so large is uh, unnatural. But it turns out that actually one can realize it with some mild fine tuning. Actually, one way to, to do it is to use the Kim-Nielsen-Pelosa mechanism, but now at the level of gauge groups. 
uh, you have two gauge groups, and uh, then when you diagonalize, basically you have a fine tuning between the two Fs of the two gauge groups, and uh, you, you end up having this effective value of alpha. Um, if you do this, and you trust this calculation, and you compute the perturbations, and you trust the calculation of the perturbation, which you shouldn't, um, you uh, get this result of the amplitude. And you see that for one gauge field family, um, this is way too large. Psi is order 10. This is 10 to minus two divided by 10 squared. This is no way it's gonna be the 10 to minus nine we observed. So what we use as a trick was to say, well, I have many, many gauge fields and then I have an incoherent sum and uh, I get this result. There are ways of getting it, uh, but you know, time is getting short and I, I'm not gonna discuss them. But yeah, Arthur has a question. Uh, so, sorry, do you also need this large alpha for your previous transient model? No. Up to the... Um, no. I think in the previous transient model, we didn't have any large alpha. I think alpha was yeah. equal to one. In the so you have a potential there cosine phi over f? multiply by lambda to the fourth power. And then the coupling is non-abelian gauge group with this phi is just phi FF dual, no parameters. Yes. I am very surprised that this gives you a large effect because now you get, I mean, this field does a slow roll during inflation, right? So you can be lucky that that's slow. I mean, it rolls. No, slow. it's not in slow roll. That's the crucial point. The field is, is rolling quite quickly. Well, not too quickly. I mean, it just, it just I mean, it, it was stuck before, right? So the, H, yeah, but H goes down very slowly during inflation. We know that H goes down slowly. So then the field well, just, yeah. it just kind of loses uh, the ability to sit wherever it was frozen and that starts rolling. It can't be rolling fast, I would say. Well, it, the, the, I believe, well, we know, we know how quickly it goes down, right? It goes down in two foldings. But that must depend that that depends on the fine tuning of the initial condition. If the field is really on the top, and uh, as the Hubble parameter crosses the mass, actually the time in which the field will take to go down is not even controlled by the Hubble parameter, but just by the natural effect that you need to get off the top. But, you know, if you are exactly at the top, you're going to stay there forever. Of course, it doesn't make sense. Ah, but if I, see, I see, I see, top, I see. Okay, you're fine tuning the initial this condition. This is why I was saying that that the real fine tuning we are having is that we are assuming that the field is on the top. I see, I see. Okay. So no, I, I believe it's not exponentially close to the top, but yeah. I see. I and understand. that goes down quite quickly. Yeah, yeah. I understood. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. Okay. So quasi scale invariant, there are ways of getting it, but I don't want to discuss them. No time, and I would be ashamed in any case. Um, um, FNL is good. Gravitational waves are good. Things are kind of under control, but. Uh, there are chiral gravitational waves again, but this, so two things. First, uh, there's a series of paper by Ferrer and Otari, and uh, the, the year is actually not 2009. I don't know why it's 2009 there. I think it's 2016. Um, that consider the possibility of realizing actually warm inflation in this case by having the gauge fields interacting very quickly with each other and thermalizing quickly. Great. Uh, by the way, the other thing I didn't, uh, I just hinted at, but I didn't say, the great advantage of this model with respect to trapped inflation is that it is technically natural by fiat. So we don't have to worry about um, loop corrections because the coupling is shift symmetric. Um, however, there is more recent work where people started finding, and I believe the most uh, complete work on this is by Valerie and collaborators. Um, in, I don't even know whether to call them instabilities, but you know, not well controlled approximation in the strong back reaction regime. This is the evolution of Xi in a full numerical analysis where we are not just doing uh, RT approximation, but actually computing integrals on all the momenta um, numerically. And you see that in the weak back reaction regime, things are under control. And then when you get to the, strong back reaction regime, uh, this smooth line is what we would like things to be and what I was hoping things to be. 
And this jagged line is what things come out from numerical analysis. And um, yeah, Lorenzo, it's, it's open, it's, open as far as I can tell. Yeah, I, I would call it instability, right? It, I mean, your solution is obtained on average. So in a sense, uh, it's not an instability that runs away. But still, I, I would imagine that your solution I don't know. is unstable. I mean, I guess it's quite a matter of name. For me, instability means that this line keeps going ahead forever and ever and ever, or this line keeps going down and goes to zero in period. Um, yeah, well, the, the this question. Is, this is even less, this is even, in a sense, this is even worse than an instability, I think. <laughs> the, the question because is I, more I, on the phenomenology, right? Because here, you, you, if, you, if you get all this strange behavior of, of Xi, this means a strange behavior of phi dot. And so the Absolutely. perturbations will have horrible bumps. Absolutely. Absolutely. This yeah, is, this is uh, as I said, uh, the, the only thing is that, and you know, I have two good people in this audience to tell me, I have some sense of how this is happening, but honestly, I don't have a strong feeling. You know, I think, you know, in Valerie's paper, they talk a lot about, uh, the, the delay, the fact that uh, there's, a, there's some time delay between the action and back reaction, and this is what generates these oscillations. Um, but I, I don't have a sufficient strong feeling of what's going, you know, strong enough that I would be able to tell, for instance, how to fix it. Yeah, maybe I can say a sentence or so. Please. Um, I mean, I, I, I fully Many agree with, with everything with everything that, that you said, right? So kind of, oh, I mean, and you, you're absolutely right, right? We, we, we kind of observe this in the numerics and then we kind of try a bit in hindsight to, to explain it uh, somehow. And kind of the best explanation that we came up with is a kind of a, a resonance effect um, mm -hmm. precisely uh, due to this time delay that, that you were talking about, right? Because kind of the, the gauge field builds up, that means the friction builds up, but then that means that the uh, the feed goes slower and everything goes down again. Um, mm -hmm. and because you kind of, you're forming this average quantity. So you're kind of sensitive to the gauge field that you produced sometime in the past, right? So you're sensitive to the velocity sometime in the past. And if you have kind exactly. of uh, the correct time difference or the correct phase shift, then that kind of leads to these resonances, but the resonances are imperfect, right? Because the entire system is still in motion and hence they don't actually explode to infinity, but they, they kind of lead to these, lead to these spikes. Yeah, yeah. So, so these are, I see. You're basically going through different resonant bands in a random way. And this is why you get this completely crazy behavior. Right, we're more or less going actually to the same resonant band again and again because we're mm -hmm. kind of, you know, acceleration, deceleration, acceleration. Yeah. But then we spend different amounts of time in, in the resonance band, depending on kind of how yeah. is the velocity with which we enter yeah. the resonance yeah. band. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I agree that this is a, this is a problem. And um, I don't know what to say uh, other than, you know, I, that's one of the things I would like to look into. Because uh, it's, it's interesting, but, I mean, it's an interesting system, right? The, uh, I, I, maybe I didn't stress it enough, but you know, from the model building top-down point of view, this is as natural as it can get. Um, other than that alpha, that even, that it's not necessary. So um, th this is where we are, you know. 2020, 2019. So it's it's work. I would say it's work in progress, but uh, it's true that it's it's a big problem. Um, okay. Yeah, sorry, can I can I ask? Please, ma'am. Because the question would be if there is a way to reduce the amplitude of these uh, bumps, which uh, mm -hmm. I, I don't remember anymore. I mean, I was trying to study it and then. Uh, Valerie's paper appeared, but then I, I, I forgot too much. The question would be, I don't know. because I don't think it's controllable, but maybe I'm wrong, maybe there is a way. But Valerie, what's your feeling? Well, yeah, I mean, like when you were, like if you compute the scalar power spectrum, right, then, then you get these bumps, but in, in the peaks of these bumps, you're violating perturbation theory, right? So you simply cannot, 
I mean, you get you get scalar perturbations of, of order one and beyond, right? So you clearly can no longer trust your computation. So I mm -hmm. could imagine that if you kind of take into account that there's maybe some some dampening effect, um, mm -hmm. which like if you take into account uh, higher order interactions somehow, right? Um, I mean, otherwise, of course, one one way out is simply to to no, reduce. But, uh, but let me ask you, sorry, yeah. a different question. In your paper, I remember you were able to understand analytically the separation between the bumps using the delay effect. Yeah. But my question is, what controls analytic, if, if there is an analytic understanding of what controls the height of these bumps? No, at least not, not to what, not yeah, because, to what we have, not accurately enough, no. Yeah, because that's my feeling that uh, we still haven't really fully grasped uh, everything, as Lorenzo is saying. Yeah, no, I fully, I fully concur with that. I don't know. I'm honestly, yeah, we were talking about that paper by Cole before. Uh, same applies for this. I really wish I had time to to look at this. Uh, but you know, some questions that I have, if, for instance, does this change if I have many gauge fields instead of one? Um, does this uh, change uh, if the, some you know, thermalization occurs? I, I, I don't would know. Think so right. I mean, also I think if you have, for example, fermions or something in the game, right? Something which where you have kind of an additional interaction between the gauge mm -hmm. fields, right? I would think that that would yeah. kind of damp because I mean, I, I would think I mean, if it's a resonance, right? Then anything which kind of dampens the resonance mm -hmm. would make the system more controllable. That's kind of my my intuition, but I don't have a concrete computation. Um, okay. So as usual, I ended up talking for longer than I wanted to. Uh, I think it would be actually, uh, you know, since I've been talking for another 56 minutes, I think this is a good point to stop. I would have talked about production of fermions, which is somehow similar, but different in a similar model. Uh, just let me show what I, I would like to would have liked to discuss is same kind of coupling, but now with fermions. Phenomenology is completely different, as you can guess, because the Fermi Pauli blocking. But in the end, you get a lot of fun physics to do also in that case. Um, but I think it's a good time to stop here. Um, as there are more questions, I realize that I'm chairing myself, right? So. <laughs> I would make a great applause to the speaker. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Lorenzo. Great job. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> no, thanks a lot, really. Um, but thank you. Um, is there any question? Sorry, um, Lorenzo, maybe you can say a few words on what happens for the fermions. Uh, I was. I, I will oh. make it five minutes because I don't want to yeah. abuse too much. Um, yeah, uh, so for the fermions, what happens is the following. Um, the, I, I guess the main piece of physics is actually this change, this field redefinition. First of all, I'm not talking about fermions that carry a U1 axial charge, no anomalies, okay? I'm actually not talking about fermions that carry any charge at all. Actually think about, um, think about Majorana fermions. Um, you have in general this kind of coupling with a shift symmetric pseudo scalar inflaton. You can perform this field redefinition by which you can write the coupling in these terms. Okay, in this form, the purple form, it's apparent that, that the coupling is shift symmetric, adding phi to a, co a constant to phi, nothing happens. What is apparent in the second form is that actually from m psi equal to zero you decouple the inflaton from the fermion. Now, physically what's happening, I'm having a, an effective mass for the fermion that is oscillating cosine of phi over f with an amplitude m psi. Since it is oscillating, if you want, I go back morally to the same situation we had at the beginning, you know, in the first hour of the inflaton oscillating at the bottom of the potential, bottom of the potential and amplifying vacuum fluctuations. So I'm producing a lot of quantum of the fermions up to momenta of order phi dot over f. So this is important because phi dot over f can be much larger than the Hubble parameter. 
So it can produce fermions with a very large momentum. Um, for instance, here I'm producing fermions with energy up to 50, 20 times, you know, 15 times the Hubble parameter. Since I have these fermions around, and again, I'm, I can get into the stationary regime where I produce the fermions and they're diluted and I have a constant fermion number density. Um, and then these fermions back react on the inflaton and they can contribute to the inflaton perturbations. And blah, 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 we computed a lot of things. It's for very long and complicated and I'm not gonna say anything about it. I'm just gonna show this plot. So this is again for this parameter Xi that as before is just Phi dot divided by FH. And this is for the mass of the fermions in units of F. Um, I'm not gonna tell you why because time is short again the green region is forbidden, the red region is forbidden, the purple region, the, the other red region here is also forbidden. This region is allowed. Um, if you remember um, from this paper by Barnaby and Peloso, non-Gaussianities were killing models where you were producing a lot of vectors. In this case, non-Gaussianities are much smaller. You see FNL is equal to 10, 1, 0.1, 0.01. The reason why this is happening is that I'm producing fermions with very large momenta. I'm filling the Fermi sphere up to very large momenta. These fermions are sourcing the inflaton perturbations, but they do it in an incoherent way. And uh, um, since they're doing in, in an incoherent way, I have a, a central limit theorem effect by which the non gaussianities are suppressed. This region of parameter space is a region where the perturbations are sourced by the fermions. So it's not trapped inflation in the sense that the inflaton is still going down its potential because the potential is sufficiently flat because of slow roll. But the perturbations are now sourced by the, these fermions. And this means that the power spectrum, when I measure the power spectrum, instead of measuring h squared divided by phi dot squared, I'm measuring this other combination of parameters in the theory. And this gives much more freedom in uh, model building. Uh, what we did recently was to apply this to a sim as simple as we could model of supersymmetric inflation, so gravity superinflation. So we consider this, I, I will not go in the detail of this really, I don't have time. Uh, models scored with a stabilizer mm -hmm. that are models with two super fields, mm -hmm. but that can allow to have a simple potential. We assume there's a simple super potential just this term here that just gives a quadratic potential for the inflaton. And this small term here that generates a contribution for the potential of the inflaton, but we're actually requiring that this contribution is negligible. Mm -hmm. But this term here ends up generating a, an interaction term between the inflaton and the fermion that is of that cosine sign form that I, I've shown before. Mm -hmm. So basically in this model, we are ending up having a situation analogous to this one. Sorry, analogous to this one. Mm -hmm. So I can just cut and paste the results from this paper and apply them to this model and what I discover is that basically I have an extra source of scalar perturbation. So I'm raising the scalar perturbations. Turns out that the vector, the tensor perturbations stay constant. Mm -hmm. Since I'm raising the scalar perturbations, I'm, I have to lower the scale of inflation so that the scalar perturbations still fit Kobe or Planck normalization. But this means that I'm lowering the scale of inflation, I'm lowering the amount of gravitational waves. So I can bring back a model that has essentially just quadratic inflaton potential to agree with the constraints on the tensor to scalar ratio that Anthony was discussing on Monday. And it uh, turns out that there is a couple of constraints that I don't want to discuss. And basically you have this regional parameter space that is allowed where F is still a very reasonable value, uh, you know, 10 to 16 GV, uh, 10 to 15 GV or so. Uh, and also, you know, turns out that there's a lower bound on R that is of the order of about 0 0.01, 0 0.008 to be precise, so that um, you know, the, this can be ruled out. End of the Fermi story. Thanks for letting me go ahead for, oh, wait, too long. So just um, 
and observation yep. parameter psi here for the fermions is much larger, right? Uh, yeah, it has to be much larger because it's not an exponential. Great question. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you, you parameter psi basically measures the UV cutoff of your uh, Fermi sphere. Mm -hmm. So the number of fermions goes as a power of psi instead of going as the exponential of oh. psi as it, it was going for. And so, in other words, if I have a model where the same psi controls both fermions mm -hmm. and uh, vectors, then vectors win. Yeah. And then fermions are negligible. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. This went really too long now. Other questions? Mm. Comments? Complaints? Okay, then let's thank the speaker again.